record it. And uh, and so if you have to leave early for some reason, then uh, uh, we'll make sure you get the recording. And could I just ask if everybody could um, uh, use the chat tool on Zoom um, uh, to to all, so that we all get it, and um, and just uh, uh, put on your put on an email address that we can contact you on. Then afterwards, Joe Raps will make sure that she emails you with the reference of how you pick this up, um, uh, how you pick up this uh, webinar uh, recording as well, if, if that's what you'd like to do. So um, I think I think the uh, Zoom keeps a record of chat, so um, that's as good a way as any of uh, of recording that if you want. So if you want us to be um, able to contact you back, just put your email in on the chat. Great. So. Um, I think there's probably too many of us. When we do the smaller webinars, we tend to just do a little um, introduction of everybody. But I think if we do, by the time we do that, we'd be halfway through the hour. So um, forgive me for uh, not doing uh, introductions and we'll just get straight to it. And uh, what the aim for, the, for today is um, some of you kind of seasoned 3 dmers that are online may find some of this a bit kind of too introductory. I hope, I hope um, there's still some helpful stuff for you in it. But um, the aim for today really is to give an overview of the things that we've learned, um, both scripturally and kind of experientially, uh, about the fivefold and how the fivefold works from a 3DM point of view. And I'll refer to some of the work that some other folks have done, particularly um, Alan Hirsch and the, uh, what's now the 5Q um, uh, stuff. He's been working on uh, fivefold a long time before he started um, developing that material. And um, you'll recognize some of the things as well because um, uh, we've worked with him on that stuff over the years. But, for 3DM, uh, the fivefold is one of five main tools that we use, um, uh, which uh, many of you will know, um, we use shapes to remember those tools. Um, and um, and uh, obviously for Alan, um, it's become over the last couple of years, one of the main things he's focusing on. So I'd, recognize, I'd recommend the 5Q book if you want to kind of go deeper than the stuff that we're doing now. Um, Okay, well, we'll get going. And uh, if everybody could just make sure that you've, um, that you've got your mute on when you're not talking, then that will just uh, mean that we don't all have background noise. That'd be fantastic. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch to the whiteboard. And uh, the format for today is that what we'll do is I'll do some, um, I'll do some teaching for the first probably, uh, we'll probably do about 45 minutes of teaching. And during that time, if there's a question that you've got, um, uh, I don't mind if you um, if you turn on your um, turn off your mute and just ask me, or if you want, you can type it into the uh, chat because then that will flag up as well. Um, but primarily, I'll be doing teaching for the first kind of four to five minutes, and then we'll have some time for Q and A um, and to kind of process it together. Um, but do stop me as we go along. If there's things that you're thinking, well, actually, you know, I just need to engage this a bit more, uh, then feel free to do that. Um, and I'm going to use the um, I'm going to use the whiteboard that comes with Zoom. So that means that um, I'm only going to see like about four or five of you once I go to the whiteboard. So waving at me to get my attention if there's something you want to ask won't do much. You, you, you either need to speak out or, or um, put something on the, uh, on the chat, if that's okay. So any, any, any questions from anybody on, on how we're running stuff before we get going? Okay. Um, Art, I don't know if that's art, art. I just see the word art. If, if, I'm just going to mute you if that's okay. And, um, and then you can unmute yourself if you want to say something. I've got this kind of uh, games master type ability to mute people here. So uh, great. So I'm going to put the screen up and um, I'm going to start fairly, um, I'm going to start with some fairly kind of uh, 101 stuff. So again, forgive me um, if this is stuff that you know before, but then we're going to, going to kind of go a bit deeper with the things that we've learned in 3DM as we go through the. Um, the, the seminar. Uh, so um, obviously uh, I'm not going to read the Ephesians 4 passage but the whole of the kind of fivefold teaching is based on that passage in Ephesians 4 where Paul uh, lists these these five uh, functions um, where the grace of Christ has been apportioned and um, I believe the word used actually does mean given out in portions and so uh, that's really where this kind of way of seeing fivefold has come from and, um, and really uh, I think it's, um, I think assuming that everybody in the church functions according to one of those, um, which obviously is a very nuanced thing. We're not trying to just put, put people in boxes here, but I think that it's a, it's a very kind of um, much in the stream of the Reformation because what we're doing is there, we're moving away from uh, a kind of more Catholic view that um, 
This is talking about a small elite of leaders, and instead we're pl applying it to everybody in the church. And that partly comes from the understanding that we would have at 3DM that actually everybody's called to lead. You know, we're all, uh, to quote Mike Breen, we're all, um, we're all uh, sheep from the, from the front and shepherds from, from behind. And um, so all of us are called to lead others. And, um, and, and the kind of initially assumption biblically and then kind of the observation that um, people tend to function according to these uh, fivefold. And um, so we've got, we've got um, Paul listing them in order. You've got apostle, uh, prophet, uh, evangelist, Um, you've got uh, pastor or shepherd. We tend to use pastor in Europe and um, and uh, shepherd in America because um, uh, in America people tend to call them their ministers pastors, whereas in Europe we tend to call them ministers. So it kind of makes it slightly. I think that's a little indicator there of how endemic the pastoral ministry has become in the uh, in the in the ministry of church leadership. But hey, so we've got those. We've got those uh, five, and the, the basic understanding that we've had through here, and this is where it starts getting tricky for me because trying to draw a pentagon with the tools that Zoom give us is um, tricky. Um, I'll do my best. I used to be a chemistry teacher, so I should be good at drawing these geometric shapes. I just have to think of pentane or something, but there you go, just about managed it. It's a bit lopsided. Um, but the picture that we would tend to have um, is almost like it's a kind of pentagonal cake uh, with portions being given to each person. Um, so I'm not going to write all the letters on, but each one of those corresponds to one of the five on the left. And uh, it looks like, somebody's got, um, looks like somebody's got an annotation tool. So, oh, I just got rid of the whole thing by mistake. It'd be great, wouldn't it, if Zoom had an undo function, um, but it doesn't. Um, and so there's a... Um, there's a picture there of a, of a cake, um, and each of us gets uh, gets a portion of the cake, and um, and then we've tended to interact with the tools um, uh, by thinking of them as almost thinking like that. That's kind of the um, that's that's kind of like the umbrella. So it's almost if you turn that on its side. Um, again, these uh, you're look, you're going to be looking at kindergarten drawing here because I'm trying to draw with a mouse, but basically. It's almost like that's kind of, um, you know, um, that's, that's kind of a, an umbrella um, with, within which then we, um, we have the, the, the kind of tools underneath, um, uh, which would be the gifts. So um, there's, a, there's, there's a description both of, of gifts and of, uh, fun of the fivefold function. And so we've tended to think of the gifts as kind of like a toolbox, um, which, which kind of sits under that umbrella. There's my very, very poor uh, picture of a toolbox. Um, and, um, and, and the idea being, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, with the, with the gifts. Um, on the one hand, it's clear that some people have gifts that are different from others. Uh, Paul's very clear about that in his teaching. He teaches about it in lots of places, doesn't he? Romans 12. And, in First Corinthians and so on, he teaches about the gifts, and um, and uh, so he's very clear about that. But um, but uh, at the same time, it feels as if all of us also can desire and want the gifts. And you know, um, Paul tells us, for example, talking about the spiritual gifts that we should legally desire them. And Jesus says that um, how much more will our Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask? So the way that we've tended to understand that and reconcile those different things over the years with 3DM is we've tended to understand it as a toolbox. And the toolbox is available to everyone, but there are certain times where um, maybe the Lord will, the Holy Spirit will take a particular tool out and say, I think you should use this. And we begin learning to use a particular tool. And then there'd be other people who would, um, who would use a tool, a particular tool regularly and get really good at using that tool. And uh, others that may only use that tool very occasionally. Um, and others who there are certain tools in the toolbox they've never taken out, they've never even thought about, they, they don't have any desire to um, access. So, but but those tools still come under this kind of umbrella of the pentagon of the of the kind of fivefold. So, it's a bit of a background there. Um, and um, and I also just the other little rider I wanted to say is I think it's important that we that distinguish between several different things that kind of use the same um, words, the same titles um, in the Bible. Um, you have the functions, the five functions, which I believe all of the people of God 
primarily function from one of them. Um, and I say primarily, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But um, then you have some of the same things that are mentioned as gifts. So for example, you have the prophetic function, the fivefold prophet, and you have the prophetic gift talked about in 1 Corinthians 14. So you've got those two different things going on. And then you also seem to have another thing, primarily in the Old Testament, but to some extent in the New Testament, with someone like John the Baptist, if we stay with the prophet as the example, uh, which I would say is more like an office. You know, Elijah wasn't just a fivefold prophet, was he? He, was a, he carried the office of prophet. And so for that reason, um, we tend to try to use language that makes it clear that we're not talking about that. You know, so I would say, I think I'm probably a fivefold prophet, or I'm probably prophetic in terms of the fivefold, rather than saying I'm a prophet. Because if, if I say I'm a prophet, there may be an implication I think I hold some sort of spiritual office there. And also there's a big difference, isn't there, between the Old Testament and the New in the way that people interact. Uh, the New Testament is much more focused around the body of Christ doing things together rather than these kind of lone superstars like the judges um, in the Old Testament. So, um, so that's a little bit of a background in the language. And uh, the first thing I wanted to do, what, I'm gonna, what I want to do is I want to talk about briefly about each ministry, what it looks like, um, then how the ministries work together and the differences between the ministries as those different people with different functions uh, work together. Uh, I'd like, if we have time, to talk about what do mature and immature versions of each of those fivefold look like so that we can recognize those in our own kind of uh, churches and teams. And then uh, a little bit on how we work together as a team uh, practically. So that's the kind of agenda for me for today. Um, and again, if there's other questions and things, there'll be some Q&A time. So there'll be some time to look at that. So quick overview. For me, I would see uh, the apostle um, primarily as, you know, it means sent out one, literally. And we see, we see two roles for the apostle, um, I think, in the New Testament, uh, especially in the ministry of Paul, the kind of archetypal apostolic uh, example, uh, example to us. Um, the first is that he goes out and starts new things. So he goes on his missionary journeys and he, um, and, uh, you know, he plants churches and he does all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the second thing is that our, over time, after he's, um, after he's done that, he goes back and he offers oversight and investment and coaching and training and those sorts of things and, and sometimes brings correction. And so I think that um, churches that use apostolic language, which is not many of the denominations, but some of them, tend to focus on the second of those two when they're talking about the apostle. They tend to use it in an oversight kind of way. Um, within 3DM, we recognize that function, but we tend to primarily use uh, apostle to mean sent out ones. And, um, you know, it's the analogy to the Latin uh, derivation of missionary. So you've got apostle in the group, in the Greek, missionary in the Latin, and it's that kind of sent out one. So, um, so, to, so it, from a 3DM point of view, when we talk about apostles, we're talking about people who basically start new things and, um, and at a more mature level, build movements. Um, and I say at a more mature level, I might do the mature and immature now just so that it, 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 it's, um, just so it's uh, quick and easy for us. What I would say is um, uh, that my observation would be that, that mature apostles tend to build kingdom movements, immature apostles tend to build empire. So one of the things you notice with apostles that haven't yet reached a spiritual maturity, in, in, in my opinion, is that they're often quite protective about what they build and they're very much the ones who are in charge and they want to remain in charge. And um, I think there are two big challenges for an apostle as they become more mature. One is, are they prepared to help somebody else's movement to succeed? Because very few apostles are really called to build full movements. There are a few, but not many. Um, so most apostolic fivefold, fivefold apostles would be, am I prepared to be part of someone else's thing rather than having to always do my own thing? And secondly, um, even if they are somebody who's built um, something themselves, am I prepared to hand it on, raise up others, and pass things on to others so that what I do multiplies rather than keep hold of the kind of all of the reins myself and stay at the center there. And so, so immature apostles are, are very difficult to lead often. Um, they're quite opinionated. Apostles tend to have a strong sense of, um, you know, a gut instinct of this is what we ought to do. Uh, they often have a lot of certainty about what they're going to do. And, um, and immature apostles tend to build their own thing and not be interested in anyone else's thing. Whereas as they grow more mature, they tend to be 
more effective at doing kind of kingdom work. Um, so that would be that would be my observation about um, apostles, uh, prophets. So um, to me uh, um, here, one of the important things about the fivefold ministry of the prophet is it's quite different from the gift of prophecy. To me, the gift of prophecy. To me, um, all Christians can hear the Lord. Um, not all Christians from all denominations use that language, um, but but if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can hear the Lord in one way or another. And you know, for most of us. The way that the Lord communicates with us would be conviction and revelation through scripture. It would be prompting. It would be, um, you know, a sense in our heart that we shouldn't do something or those, you know, the kind of the enhanced um, uh, conscience. Um, uh, there'd be all sorts of things like that um, that the Lord would use to communicate with us. And as we grow in maturity, we as Christians learn to be more sensitive to those things. Um, I think different, different traditions are open to different things. So I'm a Baptist. Uh, that's my background. My denomination has primarily been open to hearing God through uh, conviction and scriptural revelation and not really open to hearing God through anything else, if I'm frank, um, to the point that the more extreme members of my own denomination almost have a trinity of Father, Son and Holy Scripture. Um, but the interesting thing is, even when I talk to Christians uh, who know Jesus, who would say that all of the spiritual gifts have ceased, when I push them and use language like conviction and revelation instead of language like God saying things, actually they all hear God. So um, there's, the, there's the birthright of every Christian to hear God. That's, the, that's not, I don't, to me, that's not the prophetic gift. To me, the prophetic gift is hearing God for other people. And within the evangelical tradition that most of us are from, we've tended to steer away from that because it's been used so often to manipulate and to you know, glorify individuals and so the Lord and those sorts of things. But nevertheless, the Bible clearly says that we should eagerly desire especially that, that gift. That's completely different to me from the fivefold prophetic function. Um, although, obviously, a fivefold prof prophet who has the gift of prophecy is going to equip and help them. But I think any of the fivefold could have the gift of prophecy. To me, the fivefold prophet is somebody who calls the church back. Um, it should be capital C church, the church universal, back uh, to. Um, to its to its roots to um so a prophet will be saying you know we've got to learn to live the way that jesus lived um in the old testament the prophets were always calling people back to the law back to the principles of god justice um you know um back to a life lived in love so the prophet is always calling the church back to its roots um and while the apostle is often a um a pragmatist in many ways apostles are often surprisingly comfortable at working in gray areas. Um, prophets aren't at all, they're very black and white, they're idealists. Um, if we're gonna do it, we have to do it right. Um, so that's, that's my experience. Um, prophets who are immature um, often are, um, are abrasive and they haven't learned how to share the, the, the call of God um, with the heart of God. And um, and so, um, you know, immature prophets are often really hard to be around because they'll do very high challenge, very low invitation, um, often not just with their words, but with their lifestyle as well. Um, they'll often choose to live in ways that are challenging to others um, and they want it to be challenging. So um, a, a mature prophet has learned how to take everybody with them. They're thinking about, a mature prophet is thinking about how do I help this person this, this brother or sister in the Lord, to operate according to the way that Jesus would have them operate? How do I help them to do that, rather than just how do I challenge them about why they're not doing that? And um, so mature prophets become, uh, become very helpful in the church. Um, evangelists, uh, obviously, um, bringer of good news. So they are the ones that, um, that primarily uh, reach out to, um, to uh, those who don't yet know the Lord. And, um, and uh, evangelists, um, you know, in the physical world, evangelists are, um, are uh, you know, often in sales and things like that. Evangelists, by their very nature, tend to evangelize about anything that they're excited about, not just about the kingdom of God. So they'll get excited about, you know, anything from the, the new shirt that they've bought and how amazing it is to the car they're driving to, um, you know, this project that they've seen going on that they think is amazing, this 
this this nonprofit, this charitable work that they've seen. Oh, you should really get into this. So they're always sharing with others what they what they've um, received themselves. But obviously, as Christians, they know the most important thing is uh, to share their faith. And evangelists bring a challenge to the rest of the church because most of the church hardly ever. Let's be honest. Most people in most of our churches hardly ever bring anybody to the Lord. I mean, that's just the reality that we face. And an evangelist, when they're immature, um, they, tend to, um, they tend to separate themselves from the church. They find the restrictions of church, the accountability. They don't often, immature evangelists often don't like accountability. They don't like being nailed down. And so they'll tend to operate separately from the church. I think there's probably more um, evangelist-based um, parachurch organizations than any other. Um, but as they become more mature, I think the evangelist begins to recognize that they're called to, um, to wake up the church and help the church to reach out to the last, the least, and the last, as well as doing it themselves. And as they do that, their ministry begins to be multiplied. So, um, you know, evangelists that just do things on their own, either bring people to Christ and then drop them, or bring people to Christ and then try to do the teaching and the pastoring that needs to follow but get furred up by that and then, you know, really start to struggle. Um, An evangelist that's become mature stays connected enough with the church so they can do their job, but then they can also be connected with others, pastors and teachers and so on, who can help um, new believers to grow into the things of God and so on. So um, so, uh, that, that I think, in my experience, is the big maturity challenge for an evangelist. Are they going to stay connected or are they going to go and do their own thing? Uh, Pastors... um, are primarily about helping individuals in the church to um, grow into health and life. Um, and um, and uh, they, uh, they're generally people that lots of other people like, and um, there's lots of them. I've noticed that there's a much higher proportion of pastors or shepherds in most churches than the other five. Um, uh, and that's a blessing. That's God's blessing to the church. The immature pastor, you know, in, in, um, in Psalm 23, um, David says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. To me, uh, you know, the staff was like the crook that the shepherd would use to pull the sheep in when they need to be brought close. The rod was um, a, a tool of kind of discipline. And uh, I think Philip Keller in his book, um, A Shepherd's Look at the 23rd, uh, the 23rd Psalm, which was just a brilliant book, um, uh, talks about how um, particularly wayward sheep or uh, uh, lambs, particularly eventually uh, the pastor may, the shepherd may have to break one of the legs of the lamb and then they would carry it around their shoulders while the leg healed, splint it and while it healed. And after that, the sheep, the sheep wouldn't run away anymore because the sheep would lead others away when they ran away. Um, the immature pastor has the, sta- has the staff, but not the rod. So they do invitation, but not challenge. And the danger of that in a church for you, if you've got pastors in your church who are immature, is sometimes as well, they tend to take up causes based on somebody being an underdog rather than based on that person being right. And so you get somebody who starts to nurse a grudge about something and they speak to a pastor and rather than stopping to think, does this person actually need to repent? Are they being wicked? You know, they just think, oh, poor you. And then they start to take up that cause as well. And that can be destructive. So mature pastors do, do challenge as well as invitation. And then uh, the teacher, the teacher is holding out the truth. Um, and I think this is um, really about um, uh, uh, if, if perhaps the pastor is growing into health and life, um, the teacher is more about growing into uh, maturity and knowledge. And, um, and uh, the, the teacher, um, you know, loves the word of God. Obviously, he's going to be sharing, sharing the word of God um, all the time. Uh, they want to hold out the truth that sets people free. Um, and they know that freedom comes from, um, from the truth of God. Um, but an immature teacher um, tends to focus on intellectual capital rather than spiritual capital, i.e., you should listen to me. An immature teacher would, would, would say, they might not say this out loud, but this is what they think. You should listen to me because I know more than you. Whereas a mature teacher would be thinking, um, the reason that people should listen to me is because I've already gone to the places I'm calling people to go to. I, I'm, I'm operating out of spiritual capital, not just physical, uh, not just intellectual capital. And that's a big challenge for us in most of our churches because most of our churches appoint leaders based on intellectual capital um, rather than spiritual capital. So most churches 
have their pastors um, are the pastors because they know, know more about the Bible than everyone else, rather than because they um, because they've gone already gone to where they're calling everybody else to go. And so the immature pass uh, the immature teacher builds intellectual capital without building spiritual capital, whereas the mature teacher builds both. Um, and you know it's it's the it's um, it's the wise and foolish builders, isn't it? Um, Jesus says, you know, now that you've heard these words, if you put them into practice, that you're wise. Well, uh, and Paul says, um, you know, that Timothy should tell people that Timothy would tell people of his teachings which agree with his life. And so, a good teacher, when they teach their teachings, uh, a mature teacher, their teachings agree with their life rather than being something separate from their life. So, there's the five. That's the kind of introductory. That's the kind of 3DM, if you like, view of the uh, of in in a nutshell of the five. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to move on to think a little bit about how they work together. Um, but just a couple of minutes before we do that, if anyone's got any questions or comments, just take yourself off mute and speak out if there's any comments or questions on that. Okay, I'm going to assume that we're all good then to keep going. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to borrow some stuff from Alan Hirsch that. Um, We've used, we had lots of conversations with Alan back in the day. Um, and uh, and uh, I, uh, I, some of that stuff was very helpful. So something that Alan did, and I, you'll, I think this was in The Forgotten Ways, was um, he, he did a thing where he, um, he, he kind of put them almost like they were surface area. So the biggest surface area was apostle. Then you've got prophet, evangelist, uh, shepherd and teacher and alan's argument was um and again this is now moving from scriptural to observational um i'll just write the first letters because it's quicker um evangelist pastor and teacher his his argument was that he'd noticed over the years but apostolic leaders tended in their ministry to raise up all five. And then as you go down the list, everybody tended up to raise up people like them and people below them on the list. And so, um, you know, um, an evangelistic leader will raise up other evangelists and they'll also know that we need pastors and teachers because as people come to faith, we want to be able to disciple them, but may not think much about the ministry of the apostle or the prophet. Um, uh, many churches, um, I've heard argued that many um, churches uh, have gone over the years, uh, particularly within perhaps the more reformed traditions, which are very teaching orientated, to the point where, um, you know, uh, church leaders need to either be teachers or pastors or teacher pastors. And, um, and the thing is that once that gets established, I've heard Alan argue, um, then uh, the problem there is that then you tend to just get generations of teachers and pastors and nobody else. Um, and the other ministries start to kind of get sidelined. So that's, that's, um, that, that may be me kind of uh, caricaturing Alan's teaching. I'm sure his teaching is much more nuanced than that, but that was, uh, that was certainly a kind of discussion that was, he was uh, mooting. Um, and we would say that one of the things we've noticed about that is I, I think observation that in general is fairly true, but something that we've noticed in 3DM is that there's another kind of qualifier of that, which is um, leadership capacity. And we tend to use, in 3DM, we tend to use the, the L kind of uh, marker. So L, an L1 would be someone with a leadership capacity to lead one other person, an L50 to lead 50 other people, L100 and so on. Um, uh, that, so um, that, that's the kind of uh, language that we, we've used. And, um, and what we've noticed is um, that, um, that generally, um, if you've, if you've got somebody who's got a, a lower leadership capacity, um, uh, then, uh, uh, then their ability, even, even within their own fivefold function, um, their ability is going to perhaps be less than someone of a different fivefold function, but with a higher leadership capacity. So for example, um, in general, I think I would agree that it's true that it's hard for teachers to raise up apostles and prophets. They tend to raise up teachers and pastors and maybe some evangelists. Um, but if you have, say, a, 
I don't know, an L500 teacher, a very highly gifted uh, teacher, then they may be better at raising up apostles than an L10 apostle is, you know, than someone, someone who actually is a fivefold apostle, but who um, has a lower leadership capacity. So um, I think all of us grow, all of us have an inherent kind of starting place in leadership capacity, but I think discipleship could grow our leadership capacity considerably. I think it's very rare to have even very gifted people who naturally in their own, in their own kind of right have a leadership capacity of more than say about 150, maybe 200 at the absolute highest limit, which is about the limit of what one person can relate to. I think as you go above that, it's people who are learning or being discipled in um, how to lead teams, how to lead others. Well, most, most of that stuff, some people can do it um, just you know, instinctively, but most of us have to be trained to do that stuff. And as we do, then our leadership capacity increases, I think. But the reason that we would argue that, um, that leadership capacity as it increases, increases our ability to raise up all five, is that it feels as if, although we have a base ministry, as we, as we learn to be more like Jesus, and we go through the life that he lays out for us, Jesus, of course, is the ultimate example of all five of the fivefold. As we become more like him, he tends to take us through phases of the others. So you may be a base ministry pastor. You know, the heart of who you are is that you really care about people. You want them to be healthy. You want them to be whole. You want them to, you know, know God's love and those sorts of things. And, um, but it may be that, you know, you go through a phase where you think, it's a strange, although I'm really a fivefold pastor, I'm pretty sure I am. Right now, I'm in an evangelistic phase. I just have got a lot of passion for the lost trying to reach out to people and help them to know God. And you go through this phase, and it may be for weeks or months or even a year or two, but then there comes a point where you just begin to feel the grace to do that, beginning to diminish a bit, and you think, gosh, this is much harder than it was. And, um, and then um, probably what you have to do is go back to your base ministry and just do that for a while. And then, and then maybe a few months later, you might find that you start going into this prophetic phase where you become very passionate about, you know, we need to really learn how to walk like Jesus and we're getting, you know, we're getting um, focused on all these things that aren't really that important and we need to make the main, the main thing the main thing. And, uh, you know, and you may have a season where you're more prof- in a, more of a prophetic phase and then after a while you come back to the, your base ministry. And so as you grow as a disciple and as you grow in, in your leadership capacity, in, in my experience, you also grow in your ability to understand and raise up all of the fivefold. Although it can, it can be many years before you've gone around all of those. I mean, and some people may never, there may be certain fivefold that you just never really have a face of that, and that's okay. But um, so that, that would be something that we noticed. And so what we did with um, Alan's thing of these different surface areas, which we found um, uh, a, perhaps a more helpful way uh, to look at it, was um, we instead um, did it more like a, um, more, more like a, a pyramid. Um, one, two, three, what have I missed? I've missed, I've missed pastor. Sorry about that to all those pastors out there. Um, um, we've tended to um, think of it more like um, a, a pyramid where uh, the, according to Ephesians 2, the church is founded on the ministry of the apostles and the prophets. So you've got these foundational ministries and then you've gradually got these other ministries that got you know God releases all five um but it's almost as if um the ground level is kind of here and um the work of the apostles and prophets is below the ground it's foundational and then the evangelists the pastors and the teachers build on those foundations so the prophets set things up so a movement can grow so the, the apostles and prophets set things up so a movement can grow and so that um, we can see breakthrough but within that um, the people doing a lot of the day-to-day work that really makes that function well are the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. The evangelists bringing people to Christ and the pastors caring for them and loving them, helping them to grow, and the teachers equipping them with the truth they need. And in this picture, the teacher, who the Bible says is, is due a double portion, double honour, sits at the top of the pyramid, and they're looking back over the whole thing to make sure it's structurally sound, to make sure it's working properly. But you wouldn't use that... Uh, that top stone there to build the foundation because the whole thing would, would, wouldn't function very well, it wouldn't be very stable. And um, what we've tended to notice is there's a number of dynamics um, across those five um, ministries. So one of them is, and again, these are generalizations. Um, we're not meaning to say that they're always the case, 
there's lots of um, nuances to this. So I'm doing a sweeping generalization here, so forgive me for that. But in general, what we found is that these tend to be more at the settler um, end of the, of the continuum, and these folks tend to be more at the pioneer end. Um, I'm not sure, uh, 3D have used the settler pioneer language for years. I'm not sure I like it that much because I prefer in some ways developer to settler. Um, you know, if you're using the, the analogy of the Wild West, uh, the pioneers, the real extreme pioneer end of the spectrum are the trailblazers going off, you know, killing bears, uh, finding mineral deposits and, and lakes and finding places where people can settle, finding passes through mountains. Um, those are the pioneers, whereas the settlers would be, um, you know, the people staying back in New York and learning how to build skyscrapers, you know. And, um, and so, um, you know, it's, uh, it, um, you know, the church needs all of those. And uh, there seems to be a bit of a range there. So teachers tend to like existing, teacher pastors tend to like existing pathways, existing structures, because that then gives them, they don't have to worry and think about those things. Instead, they can think about the word of God. They can think about the people of God and how they help them to um, grow and become healthy. Whereas apostles, prophets tend to feel quite uncomfortable about very established pathways because their job is to create the pathways. And so usually they can see what's wrong with the existing ones and they're wanting to, uh, you know, develop. And Paul says, doesn't he, I didn't want to build on another person's foundations. And so there's that kind of thing going on. So that's one thing we've noticed on a kind of continuum. Another one that we've noticed is that these folks tend to think uh, inductively And these folks tend to think deductively, um, by which I mean, um, oh, that didn't work, let's try again. Um, by which I mean um, that um, the, the, uh, the apostles and prophets tend to be doing blue sky thinking, possibility thinking, you know, starting from a single thing, a single seed, and you know, expanding out all the possibilities, you know, well, we could do this or we could do that. Or what about this? Um, whereas um, teacher pastors tend to be more deductive. They'll look at all of the different possibilities and start reducing them down to tried and tested principles and practices and doctrines and so on. And, and so this is always true. They're, they're much more interested in what is always true, what is always works, than perhaps um, the folks at the other end of the spectrum are much more interested in what might work, you know, what, what could work. Now, one thing I've noticed from a team point of view that's worth thinking about if you're a team leader is that inductive and deductive conversations do not operate well in the same meeting at the same time because uh, the inductive folks will say, start saying, well, what about, why couldn't we do this? What about that? Let's try this. And then the deductive folks will say, here's why you can't do that and here's why that doesn't work. And, and the deductive process tends to shut down the inductive process. So what we did in Sheffield when I was leading the church there was we tended to have meetings where we defined which one we were doing. Are we doing blue sky possibility thinking? There's no wrong things to say. Let's just try and get a sense of what's out there. What's God saying? You know, what are the opportunities that are in front of us? And then later we'd have meetings that were much more, okay, now let's actually begin to thin out this stuff. Let's get rid of the chaff. Let's begin to work out what actually works and what doesn't work. And let's begin to make sure that we, what we're passing on to people is stuff that's going to be useful. I would say, for example, the, the 3DM life shakes, I was part with Mike back in the 90s of developing some of those. And I would say that um, we totally went through that. I mean, when we first started talking about the semicircle, we were talking about simple harmonic motion, the acceleration at the middle and, you know, the stop at each end. And we were, we were talking about the Celts and the, their rhythms and their seasonal rhythms. And I mean, you name it, we, we did all this expansive stuff. But in the end, what we needed to do was to was reduce it down to a, a simple teaching and a simple tool that other people could apply. And that was a deductive process. So I'd say that's another thing I've noticed. And then another thing I've noticed is that um, we tend to be focused at the teacher pastor end on individuals and at the apostle prophet end on the movement. Um, and so, um, you know, um, let's just make clear that these are all still part of this. Uh, they're all on these same spectrums. So, um, so uh, I, I don't know whether this is just an interesting thing and it may not be correct. You can decide whether you agree with me. But um, one thing I've noticed is there seems to be a link between the teacher and the apostle 
and between the pastor and the prophet, which is this. To me, the apostle primarily focuses on the growth of the movement, the growth of the church, the growth of the organization. They're primarily thinking about how do we grow this thing out and expand it. The teacher is primarily focused on the growth of the individual. How do we help individuals within our church to grow and become mature with the word of God? Yeah? Prophets primarily tend to focus on the health of the movement. How can we make sure that the movement is doing the right thing? Um, those of you that have been with 3DM for a few years will know that we had a, an unhealthy time, let's be honest, a few years ago where there was some relational breakdown. When 3DM Central stopped, there was a time where there were some broken relationships. It was tricky, you know. Um, and I was asked to basically come and lead the new non-profit 3DM um, uh, three years ago. And um, why would they ask me? I'm a five-fold prophet. Why would I be leading a, something that's designed to be a movement? Surely that should be someone apostolic. I think it's because we needed a season where the focus was on the health. And actually, I've been focused on, how, are our relationships right? Are we functioning in the right way? You know, where have we slipped into appointing people based on intellectual capital rather than spiritual capital? You know, one of the principles I brought in for 3DM uh, communicators was, it's not just about how smart they are and how good they are at sharing the tools and the quadrants and things on the whiteboard. One of the things that we need to check before we um, accredit someone as a communicator is, um, when it comes to Q&A, are they using multiple examples from their own life or are they just quoting from a book or from stories that they've heard? Because if they're not yet using multiple examples from their own life, they're not yet ready. You know, that's a classic prophetic call, isn't it? That's the kind of thing the prophets focus on. And then pastors, they're also focused on health, but they're focused on the health of the individuals within the church. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? So there's these kind of links between those two. They're the two groups that are kind of paired. Teachers and pastors are paired by the language in the Ephesians 4 passage itself some to be teachers and pastors, and apostles, apostles and prophets are, are linked in uh, Ephesians 2, where Paul says the church is founded on the ministry of the apostles and the prophets. So the one that's in the middle, evangelist, in my experience, the evangelist job, and this is why evangelists are so uh, crucial in a church, and how we, why we must make sure as leaders that we've, we know who our evangelists are, and we help them to become mature and not separate off from the church, but stay connected, um, is that I think evangelists are actually all about connection. Evangelists understand both the, the importance of individuals and the importance of movement. Evangelists know that we have to win the world, but they know that we're going to win the world one person at a time. And, um, and the evangelists, actually, I find that when evangelistic ministries are released in the church, the teacher pastors and the apostle prophets can get on with each other much better than when evangelists aren't in the church. It's almost like the evangelists provide a context within which the apostles and prophets can build strategy and come up with how we're going to grow the movement. And the teachers, teacher pastors can help people to grow and become healthy and reflect, you know, um, what Christ is. And, um, and the evangelist, when, when the evangelist is mature enough to function within the church as well as outside of the church, part, part of what they do is they bring those together. But the evangelist also connects the church with the world. And so the evangelist is constantly saying, we've got to get out there. We're way too inward looking. And so um, if, if the teacher and the apostle are both to do with growth, individual movement if the pastor and the prophet are both to do with health individual movement i'd say the evangelist is to do with connection they connect the people in the church and they connect the church to the to the world um, so there's a few thoughts and um i we can talk more about how those teams work together but um let's just do let's just have a little bit of um of q a now um, and so if you're, if you're a bit shy in this setting to um, speak out loud, you're welcome to type a question with the chat. Um, but you're also welcome just to take yourself off mute and either share an insight and a reflection on something that I've just been sharing or ask a question. Somebody has to start us off. Could you mention one more time the Alan Hirsch diagram, the APS diagram with the squares uh, and the surfaces? Mention one more time. Just explain that in 30 seconds one more time. Sure. Who was that? Who was that? Who's asking that question? I couldn't see who it was. My, Mike Thomason. Okay, Mike. So uh, all, all I think, uh, my understanding, this might be a, a slight misunderstanding of Alan's stuff. You'd have to talk to him. Um, to, to get his kind of take on it and his take may he, he may have evolved for, since then but it, um, the thing that he was basically saying was he'd noticed that generally um, if you have apostles uh, in leadership in a church 
you find all five of the fivefold ministries being raised up and released. Um, if you have fivefold prophets leading the church, you tend to have most of them, but not many apostles being raised up. If you have evangelists leading the church, and that would be an evangelist leading the church would be a lot of the seeker sensitive type um, mega churches are led that way, aren't they? You tend to have other evangelists being raised up and also teachers and pastors, but not so many apostles and prophets. That certainly fits um, my experience. So I work one day a month with Crossroads Church in Cincinnati, which is a huge seeker sensitive church. They have 30,000 on a Sunday over seven campuses. And um, the guy who led it, um, Brian Tome, I, he may not agree with me, I don't know, I've not talked to him about it, but I think he's primarily an evangelist. And um, he's a, I don't know what his leadership capacity would be, but it's in the thousands. I mean, it's like he's an off the chart gifted leader. Um, but even then, I've noticed when I spent time in that church that you tend to have mainly evangelist teachers and pastors or people who express themselves that way. And I think that they, as a team, they've realized that over the last six or seven years. And one of the things that I've been doing representing 3DM with them is helping them develop the apostles and prophets. And uh, so they've realized that. And then, you know, as you go down, I think the, the thing that um, Alan's noticed is that in a lot of the um, more traditional uh, denominations, it's reduced down now to basically, if you're going to be a minister in the church leading um, God's people, then the two kind of routes are open to you is a pastor who can also do, a shepherd who can also do good teaching, or a teacher who also knows how to shepherd. Um, it's the pastor-teacher thing, and uh, not much room in certainly the more traditional denominations for the other three. And so it's just that sense that, um, really, in a way, that uh, it, I think what Alan was saying was it was a function of the foundation building of the apostle prophets that if you don't have apostle prophets in the mix you don't tend to build a big enough foundation for everybody it tends to just make room for the folks who do the teaching and the shepherding um, so you'll have to decide whether you agree with that or not but that was the kind of background and and then that's where we noticed that leadership capacity seems to be a qualifier for that that actually that is true in general but a, somebody who's say a teacher who's really great in leadership capacity has probably grown in their ability of all five um, fivefold functions as well. Does that does that does, is, is that enough, or is there so, something else you wanted to ask or comment on with that? That's good. Thank you. Anyone else? What are some ways that you have seen it effective uh, for a church or several churches that just say, "Hey, all right, we're buying into this." Let's do it. <laughs> like on the on the practical ground level, what does it look like to go from hey, this isn't our theology or our experience to yeah, we're gonna we now believe that this is for everybody and we're gonna try putting this into practice. What sure. have you seen churches do well and what have you seen churches not do well that we can learn from? Yeah, absolutely. Who who was that speaking? Uh, my name's Casey Crawford. Okay, Casey, thank you. Um, I think the, things, the thing I've noticed is, and you guys, if you've done it, any of you who've done any 3DM stuff know that we, we often use that kind of, um, that kind of pioneer settler bell curve, um, where we talk about um, the idea that, you know, in any, in any group, oh, I'm quite impressed with that, that's quite a good one, because I'm using a mouse, that in any, any uh, group, if, if along the bottom you've got, um, uh, let's say, pioneers up at, up, up at one end, and uh, settlers at the other end. Um, um, and most people are somewhere in the middle, but um, you've got your kind of out, out there pioneers, probably apostolic. They just want to head for the horizon, start new stuff, make it all work. Um, the settlers, the kind of real died in the wool settlers would be folk, folks who are, have become very focused on making sure that our doctrine and dogma is correct and that, that everything is sound and that it's, you know, um, we're set up for to carry on walking God's truth for generations to come. Um, um, the, uh, the, one of the contexts, I think, for having a decent um, conversation about fivefold is we have to make sure we have a, a culture that values everybody on that spectrum. You know, uh, generally, you tend to find that pioneer pastors don't value settlers highly enough. And the settler past, settler, so I should say ministers, so just to clarify. So pioneer, pioneer ministers or church leaders tend to not value settlers enough. And, and settling 
church leaders tend to not value or, or perhaps find pioneers um, threatening. And, uh, and so um, if we start to try and introduce fivefold language and teaching in a culture where some of our people um, are not valued for who they are, then I think that's, that, that really doesn't set us up well. Um, so I think, I think some general teaching about, um, you know, uh, the diversity of God's, of the body of Christ, the fact we have different roles, you know, where Paul says we, we have one body but different functions. Um, even before we get into the detail of the fivefold teaching, I think just recognising that, I think it's important. Uh, one of the things I did in the church in Sheffield, for example, when we were going to really press into um, some, uh, you know, we went to the next level with our missional communities and we're basically saying to people in the church, um, what is the vision that God's giving you for um, who you're trying to reach out to? And we're really, really helping people to do that. It's the beginning of a season where we went from about 50% of our people being in missional communities to 90% of our people being in missional communities. One of the things I did was I called together some of the key teachers and, uh, and pastors, so people who are primarily settlers, I think, and said to them, this is what we're thinking of doing. And um, I want you to make sure as we do this that nobody gets hurt and that we stay true to scripture. And I actually want you to, I'm actually kind of as the overall leader, I'm commissioning you to do that. I, I'm asking you to do that. I want you to be proactive about doing that. And they do a great job of that because that's what God's called them to do. But the funny thing is, suddenly everybody's less, um, also less, protect, um, you know, um, defensive and um, more up for it because they're being recognized. So that'd be the first thing is recognizing that we're not all called to be one or the other. Um, generally, in my experience, Pioneers and settlers, certainly at the extremes, their brains are wired differently. So a pioneer will hear a new idea, they'll think, okay, that sounds exciting, let's think about that. Does it fit with scriptural? Well, I can see it fits with this, this and this. Yeah, I think it's scriptural. Um, would it work practically? I'll just imagine myself into it. Yeah, I can think, of, yeah, we're good to go. Let's do this thing, you know? So that's a pioneer way. Settlers will say, uh, we'll be good to go with it when we have empirical evidence that, it's, that it works. And, and demonstrated biblical um, evidence that it's from God and um, we need both don't we you know pioneers without settlers go crazy and uh, get themselves into trouble and build things that don't last settlers without pioneers get stuck and uh, be begin to ossify so I would say that would be one thing for firefold is it's really important that we do that and then I think it, when you're doing some teaching on it uh, the thing that Mike Green did with us when he first came was he did a lot of that um, stuff I did at the beginning about what does it actually mean where are, there, where are there examples in the Bible of each of the fivefold? How are they functioning? What do they do? Um, and we even said, um, what would these people do in the real world? You know, so apostles are probably in the world. A lot of them will, will be entrepreneurs. They'll be business people. They'll be CEOs. They're, they're often in those sorts of roles. roles. You know, prophets um, might be ranging from things like journalists, investigative journalists and reporters through to maybe um, artists and creative people, but people who are basically commenting on, on society, calling society back to ideals, you know, evangelists, sales and so on. You know, you can think of the different things. But we would do a lot of that. We do a lot of um, what does this look like? And then I think one of the biggest pushbacks we got was this idea that people don't like the thought that there's only five boxes and they're being pushed into one of them. So, you know, what are the nuances? What does that look like? Well, um, but that's what we use the gifts teaching for. So we, we were saying you've got you've got three you've got three main things going on here, haven't you? You've got you've got your or maybe four. You've got your fivefold function. You've got the primary gifts that God's given you that you're using, and you've got your personality. And perhaps the fourth one is your character. And um, so no one's putting anyone in a box here. You can have different people who are both shepherds, but they look completely different from each other. Um, you could have a shepherd who has a strong prophetic gifting. And, um, and uh, you know, who's, who's um, learned how to do um, high challenge when they need to. You might have another uh, pastor who's primarily got a, a, te a teaching gifting and a, um, a gift of giving. And, um, and that those would look like completely different ministries and people, even though they're the same broad category. So I think we talk about that a lot. And the other thing I found was that we, when we made the teaching too... Um, uh, you know, didactic, that wasn't as helpful. Um, it's really great to make sure that people have lots of conversations about this stuff. So those would just be a few thoughts. Uh, any reflections from you?
Okay. Go, go for it. Okay, anyone else? Any any other questions, thoughts, comments? Hey Paul. Yes, who's that speaking? Eric LaRue. Oh hi Eric. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> well, I was just thinking as I was listening to what you were sharing and how sort of uh, connecting to a local church with this, uh, I always thought about two things. One was uh, evaluating our church, like how are we doing overall? Not not the individual giftedness as much as those functions of equipping. Um, were we strong in ones and weak in others? And kind of bringing the low slat of the barrel up without getting rid of the the strengths really and, then, and then do we have uh equipping functions in all of those so um you know i can think of a church that has a very large teaching team that meets on a regular basis but they don't have an evangelism team and so as you look at that you see you can see the priority there played out in the rest of the church yeah. health and growth so you know just aligning the church with both those things so evaluation and equipping is the two areas that i would so you almost use the fivefold as an audit tool to look at the church and say how are we doing correct yeah and, yeah and, and yeah i mean i think the the idea of tip that where i've not seen fivefold work well uh, generally is where you have certainly it has it's usually perhaps in slightly slightly in a kind of medium to larger context but where you'd say have team leaders saying okay we're going to make sure we've got one of each of the five on our team because, <laughs> right. Because basically then you're doing what I would call social engineering. You're saying we're going after exactly this kind of person. And in my experience, when you build a team, it's usually, the Lord usually shows you person by person. It's not usually, here's the, here's the very strong list of criteria that we want. And now we've got someone that fits that. It's usually that there's someone, you know, they're the right person to be in your team. And then once that you're, they're part of your team, you begin to work out what they're going to um, do. You know, obviously, if you're looking for an executive pastor, you're not going to want someone who's totally disorganized. There are certain things, but uh, <laughs> right. but um, I, so I think I think I don't think it's that helpful to say, oh, we've got to have one of each of the five. But I think that's really helpful what you said. I think it's helpful to say we're we're a bit we're a bit low in this area, and what can we do to start to build that? And some of the and things it, we did was sorry, go on, go on, Eric. I was going to say, in some cases too, we're in. In some churches where if you've got a lot of shepherds and teachers and there's not a lot of prominent, say, apostles, evangelists, prophets, I've also seen where by bringing in somebody who's strong in one of those to be sort of catalyst to latent prophets, you know, latent apostles yeah, and absolutely. evangelists there to sort of get them, give them somebody to model after as a way to sort of start the ball rolling without having to say, yeah, You know, it doesn't have to be a staff person. It doesn't have to be a strong leader within the church. Sometimes you can borrow, even from a church down the street that's got a strength that you don't, you yeah. can partner together with them. So I think that's very helpful. I mean, I thought that I was a five-fold teacher um, until my mid-30s um, because I grew up in a tradition that basically recognized teachers, pastors, and evangelists. And um, it was only really when, as a church, we began to move more into the prophetic things, there came a point where I thought, oh, maybe I'm actually a five-fold prophet. Um, but I just also have some teaching gifting and like teaching. So I think that's really true. I think if there are no examples of each of the five within the church, it's very difficult for people to recognize that if that's their primary function. Um, the other thing that we did, examples of those teams. So we had um, a number of, I would say, apostles, fivefold apostles, who went to our church but were not that committed to the day-to-day -day stuff. And they were all, we had several who were quite successful business people but they're basically their life was in their business and then they'd come to church on Sunday, not that interested in doing more. So one of the things that we did, as we learned to use the language of fivefold, we said we, get, we want to have an, an apostolic board, advisory board. And so we invited about five or six of our most uh, successful business people. And we just once a month, um, as the senior team, we'd meet with them and we just confidentially share with them all of the things that we were thinking about strategically for the next year or two and ask for their advice. What do you think? And um, they came up with some amazing advice because they understood systems, they understood organizations in a way that we didn't. And we had some great conversations. And it was funny because what we were trying to do was we were trying to connect the apostolic people and kind of, you know, benefit from their gifting. Um, we certainly weren't thinking about finances, but the weird thing was we found 
that over the next couple of years, all of those people started to give way more money to the church. And I think it's because they felt more invested in it and they felt more listened to. Um, and we also actually had um, a prophetic team as well. Uh, we called it a prophetic council. Um, again, neither of these were decision makers, they were advisory. Um, and that was as the prophetic ministry grew, but the, the person who led it was definitely a fivefold prophet as well as having some prophetic gifting. And um, basically what we were asking them to do was to, a bit like Paul describes in First Corinthians 14, we were asking them to primarily weigh. So people felt like, people would come and say, I feel like the Lord might be saying this, or this is, keeps coming to mind. And, or sometimes, sometimes there may be things from the Lord, or sometimes it might be actually people just expressing how they're feeling. It's hard to know, isn't it? So what we got, did was we got that team to process, and that was led by a woman called Kath Livesey, who's written the book, My Sheep Have Ears, um, which is one of the 3DM kind of books on that ministry. And um, once a month they'd meet, and they would actually give us a little um, bulletin as a senior team, only about the, the most senior 10 people in the church got it. It wasn't for general consumption, but they'd give us a bulletin of, these are the things that people have been saying. These are the things that have been coming in. This is what we think God might be saying. You know, it's always might, maybe, isn't it, when you're trying to hear the Lord directly. But they say, these are the things that we think the Lord might be saying. And it was just incredibly helpful for us. And um, there was another time where I gathered about 30 of who I thought to be the most gifted teachers in our church, in our house. This is an English context, so it was for a cheese and wine evening. That's what the Brits tend to do. And um, uh, even the Baptists do that. And... Um, and uh, basically saying to them, you know, um, it feels like we've got lots of new believers. I mean, we were seeing, what, 250 to 300 new believers a year during that time. It was a time of real growth. Um, we've got lots of believers coming in. Um, it feels like we're not doing a good um, job of actually nailing down, you know, a, an actual proper process of training them and equipping them in the Word of God. Um, what would be your observations? What would be your advice? You know, so... I'm just agreeing, I think, with you there, Eric, um, that those, those are great ways to do it, to start to um, identify some people and invite them in and get them. Um, and, and, and some of those people then, who are people who have a higher leadership capacity, even recognising them then gives, gives people that others who might have that fivefold function can recognise and start to gravitate towards and learn from. So, yeah, that's very helpful. A anybody else? Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Hey, Paul, Sean Bloomquist. Hi, Sean. Hey, I uh, really appreciate um, uh, seeing the diagram on there and the, the shift, the deductive inductive, that was really helpful for me because I hadn't thought about it that way, but that makes perfect sense oh, good. Cool. to me to kind of separate those two meetings because that yeah. never goes well when they try and do it in the same room, does it? Never goes well. And so that's really helpful. I've gotten smarter actually intuitively on that or from pain. I don't know. One way or the other. <laughs> And then the, the individual to movement, that actually was a very good clarifier for me. So thank you for that, as well as the connection between teacher, apostle, and uh, pastor, prophet. Um, I'm actually in a planning thing with a bunch of churches right now, kind of as the apostle guy coming in movementally. And I have a really good friend who's an evangelist, and he is absolutely connecting us together in those things and allowing me to step into it. So that, I felt like that was a real clear i go oh that is where he's good and that is what's happening so oh, thanks for the encouragement i, I feel yeah. like that thing about the role of the evangelist you know 3dm has focused on the role of the apostle for the last 15 years yeah, partly sure. because we're trying to bring a balance to yeah. a setting where within most of our traditions you know 3dm we're talking mainly evangelical traditions haven't have kind of ignored that role but uh, i think the thing that i really feel like the lord is impressing on me at the moment is um, how important the role of the evangelist is. I think it's partly through seeing, so my wife Ellie, who's an evangelist, yeah. has been, was asked to take over leading missional communities at Grace Gathering, the church that I'm part of, which is very apostolically led. I'm part of the leadership team. I'm fivefold prophet, you know. Um, but actually having an evangelist in the midst who's quite a high leadership capacity evangelist uh, has really gelled us all to, behind this kind of thing. And it's, it's, it's ma basically made the main thing the main thing again for us. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's been very helpful. And I, I feel like out of that, I've realized um, just again how important that the evangelist role is. And I think there's actually a spiritual warfare issue there, which is I think that the enemy tends to, you know, the kind of divide and conquer strategy of the enemy, which has always been the case. I think the enemy is always working to try to separate evangelists from their local church. Um, I because I think if you can do that, then it really undermines the work of God's people. It's almost like in that description that Paul gives, in Ephesians 4, it's almost like the evangelists are the connecting ligaments, you know? Yeah, I agree. 
and when they're so many of them don't know actually see themselves as connectors so they they separate because they can't sustain long enough the, the connecting piece because they got to get out there and do the next thing so, you know they see yeah. school all the time and so well and and because that be, and because a lot of uh, uh, church leaders find them slightly disconcerting and tend to be a little bit overbearing and too restrictive to them which means that they feel restricted and they just kind of want to, you know, get out the way and get out there and do stuff. You know? be with non-Christians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, here's the last thing. Casey, I don't know if this is helpful for you, but, um, you know, as Paul was talking about how you implemented this, I actually, um, you know, I had a church, you know, just a hundred folks or so, but I was pretty intentional about this process for me when I jumped into it. So um, I don't know if this is helpful, but I, I taught on priesthood of all believers, kind of got the big picture going as the apostle, tried to lay a broad foundation. But then because I freaked people out as an apostle and a pioneer, I had an early adapter pastor teacher that actually came in in the middle there. And he was kind of, he could un, uncircle the wagons and he was between me as the pioneer. Yeah, exactly. Out there, but he could communicate well. So I, that may be you. And so we did the big picture, then he taught on the fivefold and began to bring that in. And we had a, a, a long series kind of getting in the drinking water. But then what we did is we put together um, a day where we did personality stuff, but then we did the fivefold. Um, and I actually had everybody take the test beforehand and be ready, taught on it, did a lot of the stuff that um, Paul did here. And then I had everybody stand up. And, you know, as we know, probably 70% of our people in our churches are pastors and teachers. And the way I got them there was through all my huddle leaders. So, every elder, everybody brought their people. So, the full, full court press on this thing. And we had a big lunch. But it became a training thing that we helped people begin to discover their wiring and their gifting. And it was a real win for us. And when we had everybody stand up, we put, like, all the pastors got in one area and all the teachers got in an area. and then evangelists and uh, prophets and apostles. And it was just this fun thing to see, you know, 60 people in a room and I go, all right, pastors. And like, you know, half the people are all excited, you know? And I said, all right, apostles. And there's me and like one other person, <laughs> Woo, you know? And what it did is it just helped us understand how we all operate. And what I was able to do as apostles is say in the, in the best term is I'm not your pastor. And what it did is it empowered the priesthood, but it also said, you guys are the ones who are pastoring and huddling and teaching and passing. And, and, and you guys are the ones who are going to multiply this way of life out because you all know I freak you out. And they're like, oh, yeah, you do. Anyways, that, that just that kind of helped solidify it and take all the focus off me as the apostle and had an empowering day. And, you know, and we ate lots of food. Was kicking things. Anyway, That's awesome. Thank you. I, I, that's, that was, that's one way we kind of took like a six month ramp to really press into this from, from teaching and being strategic about it. And then I took, got everybody's lists and names and who they were. And then I started launching out and taking profits and training them and evangelists. And then I worked it out. And that's where you start doing that stuff where you work with the different teams, isn't it? Sean? Uh, yeah. So that was kind of the process I did. We ended up having a killer prophetic ministry in our church. We did a lot of training around it. So that's, that was kind of a way I did it. Part of, half of it was intuitive, obviously, but now looking back at it, I go, oh, okay, well, there it is. <laughs> so now that fits. Know. What you're describing there really is, is that thing that 3DM has taught on a lot of the learning communities about as you work your way down the bell curve, isn't it? That the, the out there pioneers are never going to be able to speak to the out there settlers. They've got to speak to the early adopters and then the early adopters, if they get it, they, they can speak to the majority or the late adopters and so on. And it gradually percolates through. So I think that's, uh, that's part of what you were describing, a practical example of that, wasn't it, Sean? Yeah, and it really helped our huddles because then the pastors felt empowered to go, wow, I'm actually the leader in empowering these people, and, I, and Sean's not the one doing it all. And it, it, took, it made that real significant shift for us. So Great. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other? We've, we've got probably about five minutes left. Any other comments, questions, uh, thoughts? I've learned on these online things to just have slightly longer pauses than you normally have because people start thinking about when you ask the question. So I'll just give you another moment in case anyone else has got any thoughts or questions.
Great. Well, I hope that's been useful to you. And um, again, I'd say I just recommend uh, Alan Hirsch's uh, 5Q book. That was actually written um, uh, by Alan, but with um, Rich Robinson, who heads up 3DM Europe, who I trained up. Uh, his wife um, helped Alan write that. So it's all connected to all the same stuff. Uh, and he goes into more detail there. And I would really recommend, if you haven't already, doing just the kind of thing Sean was talking about, having these conversations in the church. I think it's a natural outflow of the priesthood of all believers. So that's a great place to start, isn't it? And, um, and uh, oh, let me just check. I think someone's just uh, written in a, uh, a chat there. Oh, okay. It's just, just uh, saying goodbye and thank you. So um, if you want to take a screenshot, do do that. And we're going to, um, we're gonna, we've recorded this. And so I'll get Joe to send, um, Joe Raps to send everyone who's written their email in the chat. So if you came on late, you didn't hear that, just write your email in the chat if you'd like Joe to email you with um, a, a recording of this. And we'll probably also put the recording out on the, uh, on the kind of website and stuff. But I hope that's helpful for everybody. And um, let's just finish with a, a word of prayer, shall we? So Lord, we just wanna thank you that you've called us all to um, work and lead in your church and with your people. And we really want to see the church functioning as a, as a whole body with every supporting ligament growing up into the head and not being immature, but being mature, Lord. And so we, we just pray that you'd help us to um, uh, really work with all of the five different functions um, and ministries in our church and release them and uh, that we'd see breakthrough in our churches with this. Amen. Thanks, guys. Great to hang out with you.